In experiment 12, we're going to be looking at the qualitative analysis experiment. And um, this is a fairly long experiment. It's in two parts. And the goal of this is to separate and identify a series of cations. So uh, I have listed up here the cations. Um, we have sodium, ammonium, silver, iron, chromium, aluminum, calcium, magnesium, nickel, and zinc. So our goal, our objective, is to separate and identify the cations. Uh, and that's in the first part. So in the first part, you're going to be given a solution that has all of the cations, you're going to perform a series of um, procedures that are going to separate the ions and um, that are going to allow you to confirm that the ions are, are, are present. So you'll notice that we're going to be using two things. Uh, we're going to be using separation, which is how we separate something into either a precipitate or a supernatant. We'll talk a little bit more about those terms um, in a few slides. Once it's separated, then we have to, then there's a subsequent technique that's used to make sure that, that we have that particular ion in that precipitate or in that supernate. So that's what we call a confirmatory test. Um, so in, in part one, we're gonna be doing that for all of the ions. And then in part two, uh, we're gonna analyze an unknown that contains five of the ions. So you're basically gonna get an unknown. Um, and in the digital experiment setup, you're gonna get an unknown in the sense that you're gonna get a series of results from the various procedures and your goal is to correct correctly identify the ions that that are present based on the first part which you're going to look and see the separation and identification of all the ions okay so that's that's what we're going to be doing in this experiment now one thing i want to uh, point out and you can see um i sort of highlighted a few one way that we can tell in a sense if some if ions are present we can take a look at the color of the solution so some ions have colored. So, uh, some ions have color. We saw this last semester with copper 2 plus. Um, copper 2 plus is a nice blue color. So whenever you saw a solution that was blue, you could correctly assume for the most part that that had copper 2 plus in it. So the three ions that are colored are iron 3 plus, which sort of has a reddish um, brown color. It's the color of rust. So if you've ever seen rust before, it's that color. We have chromium 3 plus, which is a blue green color. So you can see here, I tried to mimic that sort of bluish greenish color. And we have nickel 2 plus, which is a, a green colored ion. So for example, if you are given a solution and it is green, um, it's very likely that that solution has nickel 2 plus in it. Um, if you're given a solution that's colored, it's going to have one of those three ions in it. So just sort of mentally prepare yourself that color also plays into this in addition to all of the other techniques that we're going to do. I just like to mention that up front so that you, you have that in the back of your mind. So for the first part uh, of this experiment, we are going to observe cations in a known sample. So there are all of those cations that we have on the first slide. And we're going to take a sample that has every single one of those cations in it, and we're going to perform a whole series of steps to separate every single one of those ions, except for uh, sodium and ammonium. Those we don't separate, we just look for them. And your job is to um, note in this table, is to note what reagents we are adding and then what observations we make. So make sure that you're very specific when you're doing this. You want to make sure that you have detailed observations especially of the colors of the supernate and the precipitate, um, observations um, of any, any, any other kinds of chemical processes that take place, if a gas is formed, um, or you know, if you see bubbling of any kind. So you know, make sure your observations are detailed. If you need more room, you can always sort of recreate this table on a separate sheet if you need to, um, if you need more room to expand. So um, this is just sort of gives you an idea of, of how to fill it out. So you want to fill out a table just like this and, um, and provide us with your detailed observations. Now in the textbook, there is a area for the equations. We don't generally ask you to do that because the equations are already given in the textbook. So you kind of have them on hand already. Um, we're more interested in you making the observations of what's happening in each step. So let's look at how we're going to start. So um, in this experiment, we're going to break this down into a, a series of steps. Um, so the first two ions that we're going to look at are sodium and ammonium. Now, the reason why we're going to look at sodium and ammonium sort of first and separate is because we don't separate these ions out. These ions we're going to test for, but we're, we're never going to actually take them out of solution. It's too hard to do that. So we're going to have some tests for them, but we're never going to take them out. 
Um, so the sodium plus is the flame test. And we saw this last semester. We know that the sodium gives a nice yellow flame um, when put into a Bunsen burner. And um, just like last semester, what we're going to do is we, we're going to take the unknown solution. Um, we're going to place a, a clean nichrome wire into it. Now, nichrome is just a, a piece of wire that has uh, nickel chromium um, that's made of nickel and chromium. We dip it in a little bit of HCl just to clean it off. And then we place it in the flame and we see if we get a color. Um, so in this case, if you take a look, we have our um, flame going. They're going to stick this into a solution of sodium chloride. And this is just to show you what a nice yellow sodium chloride flame would look like. And you see that nice bright yellow coloration. So that's what the flame test would be. So if you were to get an unknown, the first thing you would do is you would perform the flame test and see if you got a yellow flame. If you get a yellow flame, then that's a good indication that sodium is present. Now let's look at ammonium. So actually with ammonium, we're going to use one of the metathesis reactions we used last semester to test for ammonium's presence. So um, just like we did last semester, we're going to add base. This was in experiment three that you did this. Um, and then we're going to use a piece of moist red litmus paper and see if it turns blue. So remember, when you have ammonium and you add sodium hydroxide, the sodium hydroxide reacts with ammonium to make ammonia gas, which is a base. And this gas will rise up and uh, cause red litmus paper to turn blue, indicating the presence of a base. So you can see they've already added the, um, oops, let's just skip ahead a little bit here. Here we go. Okay, so you can see they're adding the um, NaOH. This is going to start to release a gas. And if ammonia is present, when you place that red litmus paper over it, then it's moist, it will start to turn blue. And there you can see it turning blue. Okay, so that's, that's how we're going to test for ammonia. So we test for sodium. We do this test with the add the sodium hydroxide. Uh, with the wet litmus paper over it, and then we test for the ammonium. Okay, so now we're going to do our first separation. Um, so we've tested for sodium, we've tested for ammonium. They're actually going to stay through the whole way. They're not going to affect anything being in there, but they're going to so they're going to be around because we're not separating them. But now we're going to actually start to separate some stuff out. So in step two of the procedure, silver is precipitated by a chloride um, via metathesis reaction. So when we do a separation, um, it's going to involve the precipitation of one ion and the, the remaining ions um, being, well, it could be the precipitation of one or more ions. And then in the supernatant, it's going to be the rest of the ions. So in the case of silver, when we add hydrochloric acid, the hydrochloric acid, the chloride, reacts with the silver to form silver chloride solid. So this is going to leave behind all of these other ions in the supernatant. All of these are soluble in the presence of chloride but the silver is not, so it will precipitate out as a solid. So the formation of a white solid um, from the precipitate is an indication that you have silver. So now let's talk about some important terminology and separation. So uh, the first thing that we, we use in this experiment is a centrifuge. Uh, a centrifuge is a device that spins. Um, if you don't know what a centrifuge is, you can just do a quick Google search and you'll see. Um, these are used in to um, in blood samples, for example, they pull the white and the red blood cells down. Um, but in essence, what it does is it spins the sample around, and then um, materials that are heavy in the water will come to the bottom because the centrifuge is effectively increasing the force of gravity. So it will separate the solid down at the bottom from the supernatant, which is the liquid, which will stay on top. Now we have another uh, vocabulary where we have decant. So after centrifuging, we now have our solid on the bottom, our liquid on top. Um, and what we do is we pour that liquid off, the supernatant off, and then now effectively what we've done is we've separated the supernatant from the precipitate. So in this case, we would have silver in the test tube and the supernatant would be transferred to another test tube um, where it separates it from all the other ions. And then we have another procedure called washing. So when you do that first decantation, a little bit of the liquid's gonna get left behind. It's impossible to really get it all, all off. So what you do is we add a little bit of water to that precipitate. We kind of mix things up a bit, and then we re-centrifuge it down, and we add that water, which is going to be the supernatant, into the other supernatant. 
So in essence, any ions that got left behind on that precipitate, they'll go in, dissolve into that water, and be transferred off. So it's literally like washing the solid of any of the residual ions. So now when I use the term centrifuge, decant, and wash, you kind of have an idea of what that means. Okay, so now if we want to do the confirmatory test, so once we've separated uh, the silver from the rest, we want to do a confirmatory test to test its presence. So the presence of silver in the precipitate is confirmed by adding ammonia. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is because in a true sample with true unknowns, uh, if you didn't know what ions you had at all, uh, uh, mercury and lead can also precipitate in chloride. And this procedure, this process of redissolving the silver and then reprecipitating it would not happen with silver or lead. Silver or lead would not uh, dissolve when we add the, the ammonia that you're going to see in a second. So that's why we're doing this. So um, once you have the precipitate, this, this step um, of co the confirmatory test will be done on that precipitate. So what we're going to do is we're going to add six molar ammonia. It's going to dissolve the white precipitate and form a soluble complex. So a complex is where you have the ion covalently bound to other um, other species like ammonia. This is a Lewis acid base um, complex. So in essence, the ammonia donates its electrons to the silver ion, and then it becomes soluble in this complex. So there are actual chemical bonds between the silver plus and the NH3, and that's why we put it in these brackets. So it, you should review your complex ion chemistry um, from Ebbing if, if you don't remember that. Okay, so when you have silver uh, plus ammonia, it makes the silver ammonia complex, and then you have chloride go into solution. So uh, this, this would tell us that we definitely have silver chloride, because not neither uh, uh, lead or mercury would, would, precipitate, would redissolve like that. And then what we would do is um, we can add nitric acid until the solution is acidic to litmus, and will result in the precipitation of silver chloride. So adding in the acid reacts with the ammonia, it gets rid of the ammonia, and we get back our silver chloride. So the, the silver reacts with the chloride that was left over in solution. Now, um, you saw me write, you saw me say something about making something acidic or basic. So how do we do that? Um, it's important that you understand this because this is a really integral part of the procedures. So in essence, what we have in the previous step is we have this solution that's got some, that's got silver reacted with ammonia and presumably some leftover ammonia. So when we want to make it acidic, that means that we want to take that basic solution and add acid until this, the whole solution becomes acidic. In essence, all of the ammonia that's in there has been reacted with the, the, the nitric acid and is now effectively gone. All of the base is effectively gone and reacted away. So what you would do is you take your acid or base, whatever it is. So if we're making something acidic, we would add acid. If we were making something basic, we would add base. So you add this dropwise, and then after each drop, you use a glass stirring rod to transfer a small drop of the solution onto a piece of litmus paper. So in essence, what you're doing is you're constantly checking with litmus paper to see if the thing is turning up acidic or basic. So remember, when you have acids, you're going to use blue litmus paper, and it will turn red when it is um, acidic. So here you can see this is blue litmus paper. And now when you've added it and it's turned acidic, that blue litmus paper will turn red. When it's a base, you use red litmus paper and it will eventually turn blue when it's basic. So that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna add the acid dropwise. After each drop, you're gonna test it with the respective litmus paper. And you're gonna continue that until the litmus paper changes. So now let's actually take a look at a video of what's happening um, in this experiment. So we're going to look at the full separation of silver uh, and its confirmatory test. Okay, so what she's got here is she's got her sample. This is all of the unknowns inside the test tube. Um, and she, is, she added in some HCl, and you can see we've kind of gotten a white precipitate. So now she's going to put it in the centrifuge, and that white precipitate is going to be sep separated out. So you can see that it was kind of on the side of the test tube. So now we're going to do our separation where we decant the, um, we decant the supernatant, which has all the other ions, from the silver chloride precipitate. And she just she's doing a wash now. She added pure water and recentrifuged, and she's pouring that off. And now we're going to confirm 
do the confirmatory test. So here, she's adding the 6 molar ammonia to the silver chloride precipitate that's in the silver precipitate. And what she's going to show you is that with the ammonia added, um, the solid is going to dissolve. So she'll show that in just a second. So see, there's no more white solid anymore. It's a liquid now. So now she's going to add nitric acid dropwise until the solution is acidic. And as she starts to add it, you'll notice that a white precipitate will form. And this is the um, silver chloride reprecipitating back out. And um, she's, uh, she's doing her procedure where she's adding it dropwise and testing each time with litmus. Well, she's not testing it each time with litmus, but she kind of knows, see, now that was just, that was enough um, acid to get it to precipitate. So now we have the silver chloride back. So now she's going to start doing the tests with the blue litmus paper because she knows that at this point, most likely the, the, um, the solution is acidic. So you saw, if we just go back for a second, That went a little quickly. So here she's going to show now that the blue litmus paper is red. There you go. So you see the blue litmus paper turned red in that spot. And um, she centrifuged it down, and now she sees that she has a white precipitate again down at the bottom there. And that confirms that silver ion is present. So that takes you through those steps for silver. So first we did the separation by adding hydrochloric acid. We separated off the supernatant, which we, we're not going to throw out because we need all those ions for the rest of the experiment. And then to the precipitate, she did those tests for the silver chloride. So she dissolved the precipitate with ammonia and then um, added uh, nitric acid until it was acidic. Okay. So now we're going to do the next step. So step three is where we start to separate the two main groups of ions. We have two primary groups of ions. We have iron, chromium, and aluminum. And then we have calcium, magnesium, nickel, and zinc. So in step three, we're going to separate iron, chromium, and aluminum from calcium, magnesium, nickel, and zinc. And if you were doing this experiment, we would separate this into two different days, where you would do all the stuff for iron, chromium, and aluminum, and then you would do the calcium, the magnesium, the nickel, and the zinc another day. Okay, so how do we do this separation? Well, we precipitate the iron, chromium, and aluminum by adding an ammonia-ammonium buffer solution, and the buffer solution increases the concentration of OH- to form solid hydroxides. So you can see what's happening here is we're adding basically a base, and the base generates some OH- ions in solution, and those OH- ions in solution cause the iron, the chromium, and aluminum to precipitate out as hydroxides. Um, you remember from your basic chemistry and your solubility that iron, chromium, and aluminum are not soluble in the presence of hydroxide. They form precipitates. So now you're probably wondering, why are, what is a buffer, first of all? And then why are we using a buffer? Well, First of all, let's remember what a buffer is from chapters, uh, let's see, that would be chapters 15 and 16 in Ebbing. So a buffer is a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate base that is in equilibrium. So here we're adding an ammonia, that's the base, and its conjugate acid, ammonium, into the same solution, and we form this dynamic equilibrium between ammonia and ammonium. And the, the relative concentrations of the acid and the conjugate base control the pH of the solution according to Henderson-Hasselbach. So now the question is, is, well, why are we using a buffer? Why not just throw in some sodium hydroxide here and precipitate out the iron, chromium, and aluminum that way? Why are we using a buffer? Well, the reason why we use a buffer in this case is because magnesium is, is uh, not soluble in, in base either. So if you were to add in hydroxide, some of those other ions would also precipitate out. So what we're doing is, is we're using a buffer to get the concentration of hydroxide high enough to precipitate iron, chromium, and aluminum out of solution, but not high enough to precipitate any of the other ions out, most notably magnesium. Magnesium is the one that, that, that's true. So magnesium is just soluble enough at these concentrations of hydroxide that we don't really see it, it precipitate out. So that's why we use a buffer. That's an important aspect to understand. Now, one thing you'll notice is that I've put some colors in here, too. So if you remember, iron 3 plus and chromium 3 plus are colored, and so are their hydroxides. So the iron hydroxide is going to have a sort of rust color to the solid, and chromium hydroxide is going to have sort of a blue-greenish color to the hydroxide solid. 
And aluminum hydroxide has no color whatsoever. It looks like um, almost like glass that's precipitated out. It's very hard to see in, in a sense. So the aluminum hydroxide is colorless when it's precipitated. So now let's take a look and see what happens when we do this. Okay, so now we're going to start with the supernatant from step two, um, one. So if you remember back, it's important that you kind of follow all of this. We separated out the silver. So we, when we added the HCl, we had um, the silver go down as silver chloride, and then we had the supernatant, which has everything else. That supernatant coming from step two is what we're using in this case. Okay, so we're using that supernatant from the silver separation. So here we go. So here, she's going to add some drops of ammonium chloride. Now, this, this person that's doing this is our laboratory technician, uh, Dr. Padra Martinez, also one of the professors from this summer. So uh, she's performing the experiment as a digital student, essentially. And then now she's going to add um, ammonia, the base, dropwise, until the solution becomes basic to litmus. So again, she's going to add it, check the color change on the litmus paper until she gets the red litmus paper to turn blue. So we kind of edited out some of that checking, but she will show you um, the uh, the end result, the color change. And you'll notice that some of that some of that solution is starting to change color with the last drop. You can see that some of that iron hydroxide is starting to precipitate out as a rust colored solid. Okay, so here she's going to check the pH with litmus paper, with some red litmus paper. She sees that it's blue. She sees it, she notes the note the color change in the solution. And now she's going to centrifuge that down to get out any solids. And you can see that there is some, some colored solids at the bottom, and those solids contain the iron, the chromium, and the aluminum. So she's going to pour off that supernatant, which contains the calcium, magnesium, the nickel, and the zinc. That's going to go um, that's going to go on to the next procedure, and then we have the solid left behind. Now, one thing that we don't show here is that she also washes that solid one time just to remove any calcium, magnesium, nickel, or zinc that's left behind. So now we're going to start working with that precipitate that has the iron, chromium, and aluminum in it. Okay. So now we have to do some separating. So now we're going to separate the iron from the chromium and the aluminum. Um, so we want to get the iron all by itself um, as a solid, as a precipitate, and the chromium and aluminum in the supernatant. So we're going to do that by adding a strong base, sodium hydroxide, and hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the strong base and the hydrogen peroxide are going to dissolve the chromium and aluminum into solution. So let's take a look at those reactions. So with the chromium, we have chromium hydroxide. That's the solid that precipitated out in the previous step. And when we add a... Um, when we add uh, hydrogen peroxide and base, uh, we get a redox reaction where it forms chromate, CrO42 minus aqueous. And this has a yellow color. So the supernatant now, because of the chromate's yellow coloration, should have a slight yellow tinge to it if chromate is present. So that's how we dissolve the chromium out from chromium hydroxide to chromate. Now the aluminum hydroxide is a special case. Uh, aluminum hydroxide is what we call an amphoteric solid um, or an amphoteric compound. So aluminum, the ion, is amphoteric. When you react it with uh, hydroxide, this compound reacts to form a complex, a coordination complex, ALOH4. So, and this is a soluble complex that has a minus one charge. So this goes into solution as a complex. So now we have chromium and aluminum in solution and the iron hydroxide doesn't react with a base or peroxide, so that just sits there as a solid and does nothing. So now we have uh, the chromium and aluminum in solution, and we have the iron that's sitting there doing nothing. So amphoteric, there are two, comp there are two ions in this experiment that are amphoteric, chromium and aluminum. Um, they can react with either an acid or a base to form soluble ions or complexes. So you're going to see this going forward. Uh, chromium and aluminum are amphoteric because uh, an amphoteric means that they can react with either an acid or a base. That, that's what you have to know. That's that vocabulary word. So let's take a look at this procedure. Okay, so this is the solid now from uh, the previous step. So we poured off the supernatant, which had the uh, calcium, magnesium, nickel, and zinc. 
we have the iron, chromium, and aluminum as solid hydroxides. So first we're going to add some water, and that's just to get um, an aqueous medium around for the ions to dissolve into. Okay. Now here she's going to add the 10 drops of the sodium hydroxide and the 5 drops of hydrogen peroxide. So these reagents dissolve the chromium and aluminum into the supernatant and leave iron as a solid in the precipitate. So now we're effectively doing the separation. We have chromium and aluminum in the supernatant and iron and um, in the precipitate. So as she adds them, you'll notice that the precipitate that was in there sort of starts to go away. Um, we still have that rust-colored precipitate that's been dispersed, but we'll come back down when we centrifuge. And I believe she's adding the hydrogen peroxide now. Yep, that was hydrogen peroxide. And so she's just showing you that some of the um, precipitate dissolved. So now she centrifuged the mixture. And let's just go back for a second so you can actually see. So now you can see there's a yellow colored supernatant. That yellow color comes from the chromate. And then there's the rust colored precipitate, which is the solid iron hydroxide. So the supernatant contains the aluminum and the chromium and is yellow colored. And the precipitate contains iron, which is uh, has that rust color to it. So now she's going to decant the supernatant, which separates the iron, the aluminum and the chromium and the supernatant from the iron. And again, we always wash. So we're going to wash once with water and transfer the water to the supernatant. We're not, we don't show that in this case um, just for time's sake, but it's, it is being done. Okay, so let's take a look at the next step. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the process of how we can confirm that iron is present in the solid. So um, the process for this is we dissolve it in acid. And then we use potassium ferros uh, hexacyanoferrate uh, 2 to create a deep blue suspension, um, and that will confirm that the iron is there. So we have, in that last separation, we decanted the chromium and alum the aluminum off as the supernatant, and, and now we're just dealing with the solid iron hydroxide that was left as the precipitate. So we add in some acid, and that basically reacts with the hydroxide, gets rid of it, and gives us back some dissolved iron 3 plus. So you're going to see that when we add the acid, the iron 3 plus, the solid dissolves, giving us iron 3 plus. And then when we add the um, hexacyanoferrate, that is going to react with the iron to form um, this complex iron 4 hexacyanoferrate uh, as a uh, blue solid, which is going to be in solution. So let's take a look at that process as it's taking place. OK, so uh, just to, so that we're on the same page, this is the precipitate from 3B. So the precipitate contains the iron, three, the iron hydroxide. OK, so she's, see she's using the precipitate, not the supernatant. OK, so here we go. Here's the acid going in. And as we said, when we add the acid, it's going to dissolve the solid. So you see that there's no more solid left in there. It dissolved immediately, giving us that yellow, sort of brownish yellow color for the uh, for the iron 3 plus ion. Now here we go with the sort of the indicator, the hexacyanoferrate 2. And you're going to notice immediately, as, as soon as that, that indicator hits, it's going to turn blue. And you get this rich, deep blue color. Now that navy blue precipitate, navy blue suspension, that is what confirms that iron is present. So not only have we separated it, those these steps that we just did and forming that blue color, that is the confirmatory test for iron. So not only do we know that it's separated, but now we know that in fact that it is iron. OK. So let's move along. And now we're going to start to deal with separating aluminum from chromium. So now um, we just handled the iron that was in the precipitate of the first step. So now we're going to move on to the um, now we're going to move on to the supernatant that was left over. So in this case, we have to do uh, we have to do something important. 
Hydrogen peroxide is what we call an interferent. Um, that's another vocabulary word that you should know. An interferent is a compound or um, any anything that we add to this mixture that will interfere with subsequent steps. Meaning, so if we have hydrogen peroxide hanging around, it's going to prevent us from doing one of the later steps because it'll react with something or it'll put something in the wrong oxidation state. So an interference is something that we have to remove in order to move on. And that's what hydrogen peroxide is. So what we're going to do is we're going to gently heat the mixture in a crucible until it is dry. So in essence, by heating it up and drying it, the peroxide gets decomposed and it goes away. It goes away as water, water vapor. So that's how we remove the, the hydrogen peroxide. So then once the hydrogen peroxide is heat, gone by heating, we're going to allow the crucible to cool to room temperature, and then we're going to add hydrochloric acid. And the hydrochloric acid is going to do two things. It's going to react with the chromate ion to form dichromate, Cr2O7 2 um, which is going to stay in solution. And it's going to take our aluminum hydroxide and um, react with that and return it to the aluminum 3 plus ion. So when we add the hydrochloric acid, everything is still dissolved. So we have uh, the dichromate ion and we have the uh, aluminum 3 plus ion. And then in the final step um, for this, when we actually do the separation, we're going to add ammonia to the solution and this is going to precipitate the aluminum ion as, a in, as an insoluble hydroxide. So the aluminum is going to react with the ammonia to form aluminum hydroxide again. That's going to be in our precipitate. And the chromate is going to convert back to, the dichromate is going to convert back to chromate. So in base, the Cr2O7 just goes back to CrO4 2 minus. So at the very end of this, these three steps, 3C1, 3C2, and 3C3, we have aluminum hydroxide as a precipitate, and we're going to have chromate as the supernatant. And it just so happens that because we're switching from acid to base, we go from, we go through a dichromate sort of intermediate. So let's take a look at this procedure. Okay, so now just keeping in mind so that we're all on the same page, when we separated the iron from the aluminum and the chromium, we did all the stuff with the iron, and now we're taking that supernatant that had the aluminum and chromium and we're working with that. Okay, so this is coming from step 3B, just so that we're all on the same page. And so there's that yellow, uh, there's that yellow supernatant that has the chromate ion in it that gives it the yellow color. So the supernatant from step 3b is transferred to an evaporating dish and heated. This gets rid of the hydrogen peroxide which can interfere with later steps. Um, and what you'll notice is that when this happens there's like a little bit of um, like an evaporation that, that takes place and that's the hydrogen peroxide going away. Okay so now she's going to add 10 drops of water uh, to the cooled down um, to the cool down uh, container, and that's going to dissolve the ions back into solution. So the uh, aluminum and chromium are going to go back into this into solution, and then she's going to transfer the water to a test tube, which just makes it easier for us to work with. So the solids dissolve in the water, and now we have all the solids back into a test tube. And the main reason for that step is to get rid of the hydrogen peroxide, the heating. So here we go. Now we're going to add the HCl. And that's going to react with the um, aluminum hydroxide and the dichromate uh, and the chromate to make dichromate. So um, now in this solution with the acid, we have dichromate and we have aluminum hydroxide. I'm sorry, and we have aluminum ion. And you'll notice here that she's so the, the instructions say to add until the um, litmus paper turns uh, is, is acidic. And um, so she sees the blue litmus paper turn red and she knows she's acidic. So now we're going to add ammonia until the solution is basic to litmus. And this is going to cause our aluminum hydroxide to precipitate and our dichromate to go back to chromate. And so see, so she saw that the red litmus paper turned blue. So now she knows that she is, is basic and the aluminum hydroxide is going to precipitate out. So she just centrifuged it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go pause it here for a second. Now the aluminum hydroxide is very hard to see. Remember, I said that was a colorless solid that kind of looks like glass. If you look very carefully, you'll see this sort of area here that's a little off color. It almost looks like it's like a little bit of a jelly-like substance there, and it kind of goes down. That's the aluminum hydroxide. It has no color because it's colorless, so um, it is a little bit hard to see. And then the the chromium remains in the supernatant, this yellow supernatant.
as dichromate. As, as I'm sorry, as chromate, not, di not dichromate. We've added the base. And so now we're going to do our separation. We're going to leave the aluminum hydroxide solid behind, and we're going to pour off the chromate into a fresh test tube to effectively separate aluminum from chromium. So in that test tube is that white jelly like is that clear jelly like precipitate colorless precipitate. And we now we've done our separation. Okay. So now we're going to work with the precipitate which is the aluminum hydroxide. So we're going to dissolve the aluminum hydroxide. So th this is now how we're going to confirm aluminum. So we've separated aluminum and chromium and now we got to do the confirmation test for both. So in these steps, in 3C4 and 3C5, this is the confirm the confirm the oh, I'm sorry the confirmation test for aluminum. So it's in two parts. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to dissolve the aluminum hydroxide precipitate in hydrochloric acid, um, and then the reason for this is because we're going to use aluminon, um, which is a colored dye, and we're going to reprecipitate out the aluminum hydroxide in the presence of aluminon to make what we call a red lake. So in essence, we are dissolving the precipitate and then we're at, with acid, then we add base back in and we re-precipitate it, re -precipitate it out to make the solid again. The only difference is when we do the re-precipitation, we add aluminon. So aluminon is a dye and it is red in color, you'll see that, and it, it sticks onto the surface of the aluminum hydroxide making the um, precipitate red in color. So before it was colorless, now it's going to be red. And aluminon specifically sticks to aluminum hydroxide, so that's how we can confirm that it's aluminum. Um, if it were another hydroxide, the aluminon would just stay in solution and it wouldn't make the precipitate colored. So we have this term red lake, uh, and a red lake is, a, is essentially a colored precipitate that's colored because of a dye. So a lake refers to a precipitate that is formed in the presence of an indicating dye like aluminon. The dye adsorbs, turning it a color, and then this confirms the presence of the dye. So now let's take a look at that um, in solution. So we're going to be taking that uh, aluminum hydroxide solid from step three, 3C, and we're going to start working with it. So um, that was the solid, and we decanted off the supernatant, which had the chromium. So here comes the HCl, and when she adds the HCl, it's going to dissolve the aluminum hydroxide um, into solution. And so here you go. You can see that there's no solid left in there. It completely dissolved. So now she's going to add the aluminon reagent. And you can see it's this nice red colored dye, which is going to make the solution red. And what we're going to be looking for is when we add ammonia. So we're going to add ammonia until the solution is basic to litmus. So she's going to add the ammonia and test it with litmus paper. We're going to be looking for a red precipitate. So and you can actually start to see it form uh, as she adds the base you can see that the solution is kind of changing a little bit. So when we add the base, the aluminum uh, re-precipitates as aluminum hydroxide, but because the aluminon is in there, we form the red lake. Um, and you can see she's confirming that it's basic with the litmus paper. And now she centrifuged it down, and it is a bit hard to see. Um, if you were there in person, it would be more clear. But along the side of this, you can see little specks of the red precipitate. So uh, the red precipitate on the sides, the red lake, confirms the presence of aluminum. And that's the, conf that's the confirmatory test for aluminum. Okay, so now let's look at the chromate. So the chromate's relatively simple. So in the supernatant that was um, from step 3C, which had the chromate in it, the yellow color, color solution, we're simply just going to add aqueous barium chloride. And if you remember your solubility rules, uh, barium chromate is insoluble, so we're going to make a solid uh, of barium chromate. It's got a yellow coloration. So let's just take a quick look. So this one's easy because you just add the barium directly to the chromium, and um, it's going to make the solid. So the supernatant from step 3C contains the chromium as chromate. Here she goes adding in the barium chloride. And the barium chromate is insoluble and will precipitate if chromium is present. Now, um, if you look at the bottom, you can see there's a little bit of a precipitate that's there. That's the barium chromate that came down. Um, and it's confirmed by the, preci the, pre uh, the precipitation of a yellow precipitate. Uh, just uh, correct that white. It shouldn't be white. It should be yellow. And then that's it. And then that's the confirmatory test for chromium.
In part two of experiment 12, we're going to look at the uh, detection and separation of calcium, magnesium, nickel, and zinc. So in, in part one, we focused on sort of the first half. In part two, we're focusing on the second half. So uh, for the separation and detection of calcium, what we're going to do is we're going to take that supernatant that came from step 3A. So in step 3A, we added the buffer, and that brought down iron, chromium, and aluminum into a precipitate. And what was left in the supernatant was calcium, magnesium, nickel, and zinc. So when we separated that precipitate from that supernatant, uh, the supernatant contains the ions that we're interested in for part two. So in step four, what we're going to do is we're going to work on isolating calcium um, by precipitating it. So uh, calcium is precipitated by adding ammonium oxalate. Um, and when you add the ammonium oxalate, if you look back at your solubility rules, calcium uh, oxalate is not soluble, so it will form a solid. So um, if calcium is present, we will get a solid of calcium oxide, which is a, a white precipitate. And then we have to do our confirmatory test. So to confirm that calcium is present, the precipitate is dissolved in an acid, hydrochloric acid, and a flame test is performed. So um, in the case of calcium, the flame color should be a red, a, they call it brick red, a, a red flame um, that you'll see when you put it into the, the flame test. So let's take a look at the um, let's take a look at this reaction as it as it takes place. So this is the separation and detection of calcium. So again, we're starting with supernatant from 3A, and there it is. You see that color, that sort of yellowish color, um, that's there. So now what we're going to do is we are going to begin by adding the ammonium oxalate. And if calcium is present, um, when that ammonium oxalate is stirred in, we will get a precipitate. So as you can see, she spun it down and we get a sort of a slightly off-white precipitate of the calcium oxalate. And when we decant, the calcium is separated from the nickel, magnesium, and zinc. So you can see she's decanting the supernatant, which has the magnesium, nickel, and zinc, and the calcium is left behind as the precipitate. So now she's going to add some HCl, and when she does, you can see that that um, solid immediately dissolves into a solution. And we're going to do the flame test. Now, we, are, we don't show the flame test in this, in this case because it has to be done in the hood. But you'd get that brick red flame that we saw in the image um, on the previous slide. Okay, so now, now we're left with, in the supernatant from that previous one, magnesium, nickel, and zinc. So what we're going to do in this case is we are going to um, separate these uh, separate these ions where we have zinc in a supernatant and magne magnesium and nickel as a precipitate. But there's something we have to do first, and this is very important. This is another instance where we have to get rid of an interferent ion. So ammonium, which is present in this sample because all the ions are present, will impact later steps. So we have to get rid of the ammonium ions uh, that are left in the solution. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we dry the supernatant over with a Bunsen burner. Uh, so we bring the, the, the solids down to a residue, and then we add 16 molar nitric acid. Um, and that 16 molar nitric acid will react with the ammonium chloride via these two reactions and essentially get rid of it. So um, the ammonium chloride will go away as NH3 gas and HCl, and uh, ammonium nitrate will go away as uh, N2O, nitrogen dioxi uh, dinitrogen oxide, and uh, water gas. So um, from these steps, we remove that. Um, from these steps, we remove the the ammonium ion, and then that allows us to go through and do the confirmatory test for magnesium without without a problem. So basically, what it is is we heat to dryness, we add the nitric acid, and then we heat to dryness again, and then that gets rid of the ammonium. So once that's all done, we dissolve the residues that are left behind, which is going to be the magnesium, nickel, and zinc. We haven't done any chemistry with them yet. They're just along for the ride as we remove the ammonium. And then what we're going to do is we're going to dissolve those into a solution, and then we're going to add sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide is going to do two things. Uh, sodium hydroxide is going to cause the nickel and the magnesium to separate out as precipitate hydroxides. So we're going to get nickel hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide as solids. Now zinc is an example of an uh, amphoteric 
ion. So um, we have our examples of amphoteric ions from the first part. Well, zinc is our example of an amphoteric ion from the second part. It will react with hydroxide to make the zinc hydroxide uh, complex, which is soluble. So now what we have is we have nickel and magnesium as a solid sitting at the bottom in their hydroxide forms. And then we have zinc hydroxide, which is an aqueous complex in the supernate. So let's take a look at this um, and see what this looks like as we do the experiment, as we separate nickel from zinc. So again, we're starting with the supernatant from step four. We heat that um, to dryness to begin getting rid of the um, ammonium ions. Uh, we add our nitric acid and then we heat it again. Uh, and this allows us, this, this will uh, effectively get rid of all the ammonium ions. Okay, so now the evaporating dish is cooled to room temperature, and then the residues are dissolved with five drops of HCl and 10 drops of water. So basically, we just put in HCl, which will get everything into solution, and then we're going to pour that into a test tube. Uh, she's putting in the water now, which just gives it a little bit of a solution for the, the ions to dissolve into. So she's putting all the ions into a test tube, and then she's going to wash the dish with 10 drops of uh, 10 additional drops of water. And the idea here is we just want to make sure that we transfer everything. Um, you can see her doing that down at the bottom. We want to make sure that we transfer everything. We don't leave anything behind. Okay, so now we're going to make that solution basic to litmus, uh, and the idea here is the sodium hydroxide is going to precipitate the nickel and the magnesium in, into a, a solid form, and the zinc is going to go into the supernatant. And so she, she keeps adding the sodium hydroxide, and then she tests the litmus paper, and when the litmus paper turns blue, she knows it's basic. So now that we centrifuge the mixture to bring down the solids, and you can see we have some solids at the bottom, and we have a colorless supernatant at the top. So the supernatant is going to contain the zinc in the form of the complex, and the solid is going to contain the magnesium and the nickel. So we've just successfully separated uh, the magnesium and nickel from the zinc by removing the supernatant from the precipitate. Okay, so now let's look at um, how we can detect zinc. So zinc is in that supernatant, and we are going to use um, the hexacyanoferrate again, the potassium hexacyanoferrate. Um, and when we add it to this supernatant, it's going to react with the zinc to form a complex. Um, the chemical formula is shown here, where the zinc complexes with the uh, hexacyanoferrate, and um, it forms a blue-green precipitate. So let's take a look at what that looks like when we do that step. So this is the confirmation test for zinc. So we take that supernatant that should have the zinc in it, and to make sure it actually contains zinc, we add the, um, the zinc we add the uh, potassium hexacyanoferrate, and when we acidify that, you'll notice a color change starting to happen, kind of turned a little bit blue. There you go, so it's kind of like a blue-green now. And she's going to keep adding acid until the red litmus, uh, until the blue litmus paper turns red, indicating that the solution is acidic. So you can see that she's confirmed that. Then she's going to centrifuge it down, and she's going to show you that precipitate. So you see we have that blue-green precipitate confirming the presence of zinc. So if zinc was in there, we would get that blue-green precipitate out of the um, supernatant, uh, indicating that zinc is there. Okay, so now we're left with um, the solid from that step, which has the magnesium hydroxide and the nickel hydroxide. And we have to be able to separate these two. So the way that we're going to do the separation is we're going to add ammonia. And what ammonia is going to do is uh, ammonia reacts with nickel to form a complex um, of nickel ammonia. So it's nickel ammonia 6, which is a 2 plus ion that dissolves into solution. So there is some complex chemistry taking place here, some uh, Lewis acid base chemistry, where the ammonia goes in and um, gives its electrons to the nickel, forming this complex. So what's going to happen is, is the nickel is going to dissolve into solution as this complex, but the magnesium doesn't have that chemistry. It doesn't do that chemistry. So the magnesium stays as a precipitate. 
So after adding the ammonia um, and mixing the solution up, you're going to have a precipitate of magnesium hydroxide. Basically, nothing happened to the magnesium hydroxide, but the nickel is going to go into solution. So when you separate those two, when you separate the, the supernatant from the precipitate, we can test for nickel um, using something called dimethyl glyoxide. So dimethyl glyoxide will react with nickel, this nickel complex in the supernatant. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is dimethyl glyoxide. And when um, these two react uh, and they form, they, they form a solid and it's this really bright sort of strawberry cherry red um, mixture that forms, it, it, it immediately makes the solution look um, like this nice, beautiful, bright red. So you can, you can tell immediately if nickel is present from that uh, that interaction between the dimethyl glyoxime and the nickel complex. So um, this is what we do to confirm that nickel is present in that supernate because um, if we didn't if we didn't do this test, uh, since nickel dissolves into a colorless solution, you wouldn't necessarily know that nickel was there unless it turned the dimethyl glyoxime red, in which case you would know for sure that the nickel was there. So that's why this is the confirmatory test. And there's one important thing to mention. Um, what we do at this point is we keep repeating this step. So after once we once we determine that nickel is present, if we get the cherry red, we go back to that magnesium hydroxide solid, and we'll add some more ammonia. And the idea is is we keep we're going to add some ammonia, and if any nickel is there, it'll dissolve. We re-centrifuge it and pour off the nickel, and we add some more dimethyl glyoxime. If that, turns, if that turns red, we know that there's still nickel that was in there. So we keep doing this step. We keep essentially washing the magnesium hydroxide with ammonia until the supernatant stops turning red. And this will get rid of all of the nickel. So you keep washing with ammonia the magnesium hydroxide until the supernatant does not turn red with the dimethyl glyoxime. And that allows us to get rid of the nickel. So the nickel could interfere with the next step, which is why we have to get rid of it completely. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So we're using the precipitate from 5A, which has the magnesium and the nickel hydroxides in it. And now she's going to add five drops of water and five drops of concentrated ammonia. So what she's actually adding in this frame is the water. The ammonia has to be added off camera in the hood because it is um, very smelly. So you can see that the ammonia dissolves the nickel and there was a precipitate left behind. So uh, she's go we'll kind of go back and do that. So now after centrifugation, you can see there's a precipitate, which is the magnesium hydroxide. And there's this uh, supernatant, which contains the nickel, if nickel is present. And so we, we separate this out. We wash the solid once with water, which is not stone. And then we're going to do the confirmatory test. So from the supernatant that we just separated, which has the nickel in it, and it's the nickel ammonia complex. We add dimethyl glyoxime. And here we go. Now she's going to add the drop. And you can see that it forms that reddish color immediately. So the cherry red color confirms that there is um, the nickel present. So again, uh, as a reminder, the precipitate from 5A, the magnesium hydroxide, is repeatedly washed with ammonia until all of the nickel is, is gone, until the dimethyl glyoxime stops turning red. Okay, so now we're left with our final ion. We have uh, the nickel hydroxide was removed. Um, we That was in the precipitate. Uh, I'm sorry, that was in the supernatant. So now we have the precipitate from the previous step, which is just magnesium hydroxide. So we have to make sure that this precipitate is, in fact, magnesium hydroxide. So we're going to do a process very similar to what we do with aluminum we're going to form a lake. In this case, it's going to be a blue lake. So we're going to use kind of a similar procedure. We're going to dissolve the magnesium hydroxide in, in hydrochloric acid. Now, the only reason we're doing this is because we then add the magnesium reagent, which is our dye. Um, and when magnesium reagent is present, uh, when the magnesium hydroxide precipitates out subsequently, it will stick to that magnesium hydroxide and give it a blue color or a blue, what we call a lake. So we dissolve the magnesium hydroxide to get it back into solution. We add the magnesium reagent so that that's there and ready to go. And then we re-precipitate with sodium hydroxide. So we put the sodium hydroxide in and we make the solution basic. 
the magnesium reagent will stick to the magnesium hydroxide that forms, giving us a blue lake or a blue precipitate. So let's take a look at that, um, the confirmatory test for magnesium. So we have the, pre the precipitate from 5A, which contains the magnesium hydroxide. And it has um, some solution over it because uh, we've been washing it with ammonia. So we add two drops of HCl to that solution, and the HCl is going to dissolve the magnesium hydroxide. Now she's adding the magnesium reagent, which you can see goes in with like a yellowish color. Now here's the most important thing. We start to make the solution basic until it's basic to litmus. And you'll notice immediately as she starts adding the sodium hydroxide, the solution starts to turn blue which is an indication that you probably have magnesium. So she's going to keep adding the sodium hydroxide until the litmus paper, until red litmus paper turns blue, indicating that the solution is basic, which is what we need for the magnesium hydroxide to precipitate out. So there she shows you the blue color. So the mixture is centrifuged, and you can see that it has this nice blue color. And down at the bottom, there are some blue specks or some blue solid, which is the blue lake. It is a little hard to see in this video, but take my word for it, that blue coloration is definitely an indication that you have magnesium. Okay, so that takes you through the sequence of steps for the gnome. So now you have all of your observations. Uh, you have all the reagents that are added and all of the observations for all of the ions in the known. So that's the known. Now let's take a look at what we're going to do in part two. So in part two, your job is to go and identify cations in two unknowns. So uh, on the second part of the custom data sheet, you're going to get a series of observations. Basically, if you were in lab, these are the observations you would have made. Your job is to read through each of these observations step by step and to decide is there an ion that is confirmed? If yes, indicate which one. So, you know, you're going to look through these things and you're going to look for not just indications that an ion is present, but you're going to look for the confirmatory test that the ion is present. So, for instance, you know, um, you can look, when you look through here, you can kind of see already that there's a confirmatory test in this one that's giving you an indication that's there. So, what we're looking for is along the way, where are the ions confirmed? And if, if so, so um, which one is it? So you would put, for example, like let's say uh, in this case for two, if you f had the confirmatory test that was positive for silver, you would write silver Ag plus here. Then down at the bottom, you're going to identify the five cations that are present. So you're going to do this for two unknowns. They're going to have different, um, they can have the same or different ions. And then that's your job. That's how you're going to finish this. So what should you expect on the quiz from experiment 12? Well, first of all, um, you have all of the reactions in your textbook. So there's really no point to memorize all of those reactions. But what you can expect for, exp for experiment 12 is something more along the lines of what we've done here for the unknown. right? So we can give you these observations and we may not even necessarily give you the steps, the explicit steps like we do here. We may just give you a sequence of observations and then it'll be your job to figure out what cations are present. And we might even give you sort of segmented things. Like for example, we might only give you some ions from um, part one and two. Like uh, we might say, hey, you have an unknown that has ammonia, ammonium, silver, and sodium. Uh, and then we give you some observations. So you kind of see that that's like a group that we might give you. Or we could give you iron, chromium, and aluminum. That would be a logical group to give you. Um, where you, where we could just give you the observations for those steps. Or, you know, uh, calcium, magnesium, nickel, and zinc. So you can kind of see, like, you may not get this entire thing on the, the quiz or on the final, but you might get parts of it. Um, or you may get p bits and pieces of it uh, as, as we decide to kind of ask. So, so that's what you can expect for the, the, the final exam. You know, other things to make sure that you understand from this experiment are the color changes, the observations you would expect. Um, you should be familiar with the reactions, meaning, you know, uh, you should have them handy and, and um, be able to understand them. Uh, you should know what the colors are. Uh, you should know what the amphoteric ions are. Um, you should know what ions are colored in the, in the beginning. 
So you can kind of see that there's a lot of chemistry that takes place. And just make sure that as I've presented it, you understand the vocabulary words um, and the various aspects of, of the experiment. Okay, guys, good luck. Um, make sure to submit the data, the custom data sheet uh, on Blackboard uh, on the due date on the syllabus.